Welcome back to another episode of Spill the Z with Dr. Hendrix and Gabriel D. That is me and Lava Lee. We are back once again. We're back once again. Today, we're going to be discussing a new topic, something that we may have discussed a little bit in the past, but specifically, we're going to be reviewing how the HPV vaccine is available for adults out there to further reduce their risk of contracting HPV or any of the related issues that can come along with it. I think the majority of patients that I talk to have not been vaccinated yet, and so I wanted to make sure that patients out there understood that they had an option to further reduce their risk. So we'll be talking about some things like age requirements, uh, insurance coverage, what HPV is, and pretty much everything in between there. So thank you for your service. (laughs) I'm assuming that a lot of people don't know about it, right? Yeah, I mean, it's really commonly uh, administered in the teen years. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of pediatricians and family medicine doctors are able to target that population well. Of course, you're getting lots of vaccines during that time. But as we get into adulthood, we are less commonly educated on what vaccines are appropriate for us. And maybe sometimes too, doctors don't assume that you are at high risk based on your sexual activity, or maybe that's not something that you discuss with your provider. So there's many different reasons why maybe your doctor hasn't mentioned it to you, or maybe why this isn't a good option for you. But if you are concerned about HPV and some of the complications that can come along with it, this could be great to reduce your risk. And that's what we're here for, to educate the viewers and bring awareness. Exactly. So first, let's start with the basics. What is HPV? So HPV, or the human papillomavirus, is a very common virus. There's actually over 200 different strains, and over 40 of them can actually be contracted through direct sexual contact. Wow, that's crazy. HPV infects the skin and mucous membranes, and it's actually the most common STD on the planet. Wow, I did not know that. Exactly, and most people don't. And the reason is, is the majority of patients don't ever have any symptoms. But some types of HPV can cause things like warts, so genital warts, specifically when we're thinking about STDs, and other kinds can actually cause cancer, so it can be much more severe. So reducing the risk of either of these can be really important for many patients out there. I feel like different than the other STDs, HPV has a vaccine, and if there's a vaccine, why not take it? Right, and we're going to talk about some reasons why maybe you should or shouldn't take it, some contraindications possibly, um, Um, And of course, it's your own health journey. Not everyone is pro-vaccine, as they like to say, or anti-vaccine or whatever you want to be. Just make sure you're having an educated understanding of the decision you want to make and that it's between you and your provider. Yeah, and the majority of HPV infections actually result in no symptoms. Typically, the immune system is very thorough at clearing it out between one and two years after contracting the virus. And most patients that have had it in the past Mm -hmm. have no idea and will likely never have to worry about it because their immune system did a great job of clearing it out. But there are many patients that unfortunately their immune system for whatever reason doesn't locate the virus and that's where complications can occur. So you have to determine what is your risk versus benefit when you want to proceed with any type of medical procedure, even a vaccine. And how is HPV transmitted? HPV is primarily transmitted through intimate skin-to-skin contact. So you're thinking during anal intercourse, vaginal intercourse, oral intercourse, any time that those areas are coming into close contact, technically HPV can be spread. The difficult part, a lot of times patients don't have any sign or symptoms, so you're not aware that you could be at risk of spreading it yourself or contracting it from someone that you may be intimate with. Yes. And while sexual intercourse is the most common way that HPV is spread, it can also be spread just by skin to skin contact. So that means genital to genital areas coming into contact, despite not having any sort of penetration, can still result in the spread of the virus. Is HPV the only STD that you can get without penetration? No. So there are actually other ones. Syphilis, an example, can be spread from skin to skin contact to a bacterial STD. And then another, you know, commonly transmitted viral STD would be herpes or HSV, which can be transmitted very similarly from skin to skin contact. Now, that being said, a lot of people are looking for activities that are going to reduce their risk right. of developing an STD, especially if it's a new encounter. So you still have to be aware that many of these things can be transmitted by just touching skin to skin, not just penetration. Crazy, something that we always need to be aware of it. Yeah, and that's why the vaccine, even if maybe you're not thinking of your situation right now, may be important to consider because it can protect you from skin to skin type infection spreading in the future. Right, prevention is everything. Exactly. And what is low risk HPV? So low risk HPV is generally referred to the different strains of the human papillomavirus that do not result in cancer, but would result in something more benign or less severe like genital warts. Now, certainly this can be a very severe 
reaction for many people out there, but we still classify anything that is not going to be causing cancer as a low-risk HPV strain. That's the most common? Not necessarily. So there are many different common types, and some can cause genital warts, while others can cause cancer. The most common version of the low-risk or genital wart-causing HPV strains are both strain 6 and 11, which are in the Gardasil or HPV vaccine. And these two strains are actually the most common causes of genital warts. So by getting the vaccination, you really reduce your risk of developing genital warts in the future. Wow, that's great. Yeah, and so if you don't know what genital warts are, they're typically small finger-like projections uh, that are skin colored. Sometimes they can be a little gray, sometimes they can be a little red, depending on if they're inflamed. Oftentimes they're easily removed by a dermatologist or a medical provider, and sometimes they can come back. But in general, in about one to two years, your immune system often will clear them out. But most people don't really like that experience. Right. And so if there is an option for them to reduce that risk or prevent it, we certainly want to recommend it. And what is high risk HPV? Yeah, so in contrast to low risk HPV, high risk HPV are going to be those strains that are more likely to result in a potential cancer diagnosis. The reason is these types of human papillomavirus strains insert themselves into our genetic code and then those cells start to malfunction and then wow. they result in cancer. Specific strains that we consider high risk are HPV 16, 18, 31, 33, and 45. And all of these can be vaccinated against. So again, another reason to consider that as an option if that's something you're interested in. And that's incredible. You came, you protected from all those different variations of HPV. Exactly. And these types of HPV typically will infect the cells of the cervix for females, the anal tissue, the back of the throat or the wow. oral tissue, and can result in cancer in any of these areas. So that can be a very effective reason for people to consider the vaccine. As we do know, over time, since the vaccine was introduced, the rates of cervical cancer for women have dramatically reduced. Wow. Yeah, and of course, the majority of those patients that have experienced this change were vaccinated when they were very young. Mm. The majority of patients that get the Gardasil or HPV vaccine are typically, again, in their teen years, and they've really just started to promote the idea that adults should be considering this vaccine, especially if they would consider themselves high risk or if they have multiple sexual partners, things like that. And what are the types of cancers that are linked to HPV? So there are six main types of cancers that typically can result from a high-risk HPV infection. So we think cervical cancer, which is typically the most common HPV-related cancer for women. This, of course, is decreasing, but still the most common. We think of cancers of the vagina or the vulva, so two other areas that women are going to experience those symptoms. We think of oropharyngeal cancer as well, so the back of the throat. This is actually the most common HPV-related cancer for men, and that can be confounded by other factors, but certainly a big risk factor for men in general. Then we think of cancer of the penis and then cancer of the anal area. So all of those are the main places that these HPV infections can result in a much more severe complication over time. Everywhere. That's crazy. Pretty much the entire genitalia for men and women, yeah. <laughs> oh, the body. Oh, the body. And you know, there's always things trying to come at us. And yes, our immune system in general is extremely competent. For the majority of patients, it's cleared out. But we want to be aware of those little pockets or areas where we could fall ourselves into if we're not properly taking care of ourselves and using all the best scientific methods to prevent infections. I mean, if it's available, why not? Yeah, I mean, and that's, again, my perspective, your perspective. Everyone has their own ideology on right. what's best for them, and I would never come between someone and their own medical decision-making, especially if they're talking to their own medical provider, mm -hmm. who I hope is who they get their information from. Um, but yeah, to each their own, you know? We're just here to give information. <laughs> Yes, we're just here to give information, answer questions. Hopefully not inflame anyone. <laughs> well, we only get good comments and good people out there. So. Mm -hmm, right. And how common are these cancers? So in the United States, there are around 40,000 new cases of HP-related cancers per year. And about half of those, or 20,000 cases, are typically related to the oropharyngeal area, so the mouth, the throat. And of course, again, we worry a lot about this because in contrast to cervical cancer, which is decreasing over time, the oropharyngeal cancers are increasing over time specifically in men. And what we do know as well is that HPV is responsible for about 70% of all oropharyngeal cancers, especially wow. in men. We also know about 50 to 60% of penile cancers in men are related to HPV. So all these things, you know, we need to take into account, especially right. if you would consider yourself high risk and consider getting the vaccine. Crazy to think that this is all related, linked together with HPV. And unfortunately, what the data shows is these cancers 
are higher in men that have sex or sexual encounters with other men or those with HIV. So we don't want to be aware in the LGBTQ plus community, these things are at higher risk for us. And how does HPV present for those infected? So most commonly, those with HPV are going to have no symptoms. They're going to be considered asymptomatic mm. or no presentation. You're going to have no idea you have the infection. And so a lot of the times as well, the body's going to clear out that infection on its own, typically within about one to two years of it becoming an issue. And so we won't even know what's going on and our right. body's hard at work to fix it. But in the rare cases that presentation is different, sometimes you can have genital warts, other times cancer's developing, but there's still no signs or symptoms. I feel like that's the problem, right? When there's no symptoms, we don't see it. So there's no medication mm -hmm. that we take. There's no vaccine that we are worried to take. Yep. Exactly. It's already over. It's yeah. already, you know, progressing. And then, and again, because the areas happen for men often in the anal area or rectum, often in the throat or a pharyngeal area, there's not a lot of people looking in that right. area. You know, your dentist can't see all the way down your throat. Yeah. And so that is the, the concern there is that these things go on at a prolonged period without anyone knowing what's, you know, happening as it's progressing. And it can cause something more serious like cancer. Exactly. And how common is natural clearance of HPV? So approximately 90% of wow. those that are infected with HPV, that infection is going to be cleared by the body. Now, the odds sound great. Right. Nine in 10 people are going to completely walk away from any type of infection unscathed. What, that 10%? That's me. I'm always that 10%, <laughs> 1%, that random person who's going to have that yeah. outlier experience. So that's how I look at my own health care. Mm -hmm. That's how I look at my own journey. But everyone's different. Some people would say, I'm always in the nine, so I have nothing to worry about. So again, something that you want to consider for yourself and determine what's going to be best for you. What are factors influencing clearance? So some of the things that we know that impact your body's ability to clear an infection like HPV is certainly going to be age. So the older we get, the harder it is to clear yeah. out an infection. Our immune system, so how competent your immune system is, if you have any sort of immune deficiency, that's going to put you at a higher risk. The number one lifestyle associated factor, though, is smoking. Uh, we happen to know tobacco use or any type of smoking specifically related to tobacco is what the clinical studies were showing is going to dramatically increase your risk of developing cancer. And those two that we worry about are cervical cancer and the oropharyngeal wow. cancer, because not only does HPV cause cancer of the throat, the mouth, the tongue, smoking causes cancer in all these areas as well. So when you add those two together, you're going to dramatically increase your risk of a poor outcome. So if you're at high risk, if you don't think the vaccine is good for you and that's not an option, maybe consider cutting back on smoking because that can reduce your risk as well. We always talk about lifestyle changes here. And this is another thing that if you make those changes, yes. you will decrease your chances of getting HPV. Exactly. And of course, tobacco use is linked to so many other issues that, of course, removing it could be a good option for you for many reasons. And how is HPV tested in men? So this is where it gets a little tricky. So for women, the cervical pap smear is a great way to check for HPV in that area and dramatically reduce the risk of complicated cancers progressing because they can target where the cells are infected. Mm -hmm. They can target where there's atypical cells and cut them out or get rid of them and multiple treatment modalities. For men, we don't have a clinically approved uh, sort of screening test. And oh. so you can consider having your doctor do a pap smear of the anal area if you're concerned that you're at risk there. They take a probe with some brush fibers on it and they twist it right and left and then they test those cells for any atypical cells present or the presence of a virus. But as you know, the anal cavity, the rectum, quite large. So you can't right. really screen that whole area. So in general, there's no real way for men to know if they have HPV, especially in other areas beyond there. So the screening test really, again, puts more weight on the fact that this vaccine can be so effective and so helpful because we're not really sure what could be going on in these areas as there's no real concrete way to screen for HPV in men. Wow. Mm -hmm. So we just never know. You just never know. <laughs> but again, remember, you add in all these things we talked about, 90% of people are yeah. going to clear it on their own. Yada, yada, yada. There's many reasons why this doesn't affect the large majority mm -hmm. of people. But there is a group of people who would say this is affecting me. This is a, you know, a problem and something that I wish I had done something yeah. that could have prevented it you know, back in the past. This is one of those things that is better to prevent than to remedy, right? For us, for you, for your decision, for my decision too, but everybody's different. So it depends on what they think is best for them. Yeah. It's important to point out that we're talking about us, yes. what we think, our opinion. Exactly. You know, I'm trying to provide medical uh, education on the topic, but vaccination is a huge one. 
Uh, and so it's really up to the person who's making the decision for themselves. If there's a vaccine for me, sign me up. I'll take it. <laughs> I'm pretty much the same too, but I guess this has uh, become more of a, a, a treacherous discussion topic Definitely. than, than uh, it used to be. But I, I, it's funny, when I was younger and all the time going through, especially going through school, I would always ask my primary doctor, is there anything else I can get? Can yeah. I get another vaccine? Can I get this? And I would check my titers, which is where you actually draw your blood and you can see how well your immune system is responding and preventing wow. infection. And so I'd be always into that stuff and thought I'd be an immunologist at some point, which is a study of the immune system. That's and interesting. Yeah, it's super interesting, but that's just not where life took me. Now we're in YouTube talking about vaccines, which is pretty much the <laughs> hey, same. You know, it's the same. <laughs> <laughs> and what is the best way to prevent HPV infection? Ah, uh, yes, to the final question. So the best way to prevent HPV infection is going to be using an HPV vaccine. The most common one that we are often referring patients for is called Gardasil 9. It contains nine viral strains that you can be protected from, some that cause genital warts, the most common ones, and some that cause cancer, the most common ones. So really, it's a great way to consider protecting yourself from a wide variety of infections that can cause lifelong complications. And then we think about who is eligible. So certainly there is a large group of kids because right. it is targeted towards that audience. But now we know that adults aged 25 to 44 that would consider themselves high risk are able to get the vaccine and it's covered by their insurance. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so since the passing of the Affordable Care Act, the CDC is able to provide recommendations on what vaccines we should get. And if the CDC recommends them, your insurance has to cover them. So luckily, the CDC does recommend this vaccine for us if you are considering yourself high risk. LGBTQ plus people, of course, are at the top of that list because we have been statistically at a higher risk of developing these infections. So consider getting it done. It is a three injection series. You go, of course, day one, then one month later, and then six months later. You can go to a local drugstore, like we went to a grocery store. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go to your primary care doctor's office. You can go anywhere that a medical provider is present and they can give you their prescription. We didn't need a prescription and you often don't because again, your insurance will cover it at a pharmacy. But this is not a decision you should make lightly. This is definitely something you wanna to talk to your doctor about. You wanna make sure that they recommend it for you. You wanna make sure you're confident that it is a good decision because side effects can occur with any type of vaccine, not just Gardasil, of course, injection site can cause irritation, redness, yeah. swelling. We were pretty sore for a few days later, which is pretty common. And then you want to consider the more severe consequences, something like Guillain-Barre syndrome, where it can cause paralysis. Any vaccine, specifically the flu vaccine, is often related to it. And a very, very rare group of people can cause something where you become progressively more paralyzed. Typically, this is a temporary diagnosis, but it can happen it's and possible. it can last a lot longer than temporary. So you want to weigh all the odds. They even yeah. asked us about that syndrome on our paperwork. I don't remember if you saw it. Said, mm -hmm. have you ever had Guillain-Barre? Yeah. Um, so something to consider. But everyone should make a decision based on what is appropriate for you, your medical history, and your guidance from your doctor. But I really enjoyed this conversation. Actually, while mm -hmm. educating ourselves on it is when we went and got the vaccine. Yes. So these types of discussions are really cool for us because we get to dig into topics that I haven't discussed since I was in medical school, a resident and so being able to provide this education to you all out there has yeah. been so much fun so please leave us comments below for other topics that we can discuss for you they we'll help me hear recommendations if you yeah. have any if you haven't yet subscribe to the channel like the video share post get your vaccine if you want or not yeah and again these help me because this is why i went into medicine to yeah. continue learning to continue challenging myself and educating other people out there so i hope you enjoyed this talk we look forward to seeing you at our next video so until then we will see you next week we'll see you next week bye bye so funny we were doing those videos so faster now that we don't have anything funny in the videos anymore I know. <laughs> but now people are like where's Where the, the funny, funny?